grace and mercy and peace to you from God our Father and from our dear Savior Jesus. Amen. Our sermon text today is the Holy Gospel lesson which we have just heard, dear friends in Christ. A sinful woman comes to a Pharisee's house, Luke tells us. Well, if that isn't the beginning of a story, I don't know what is. If you didn't know already what Pharisees thought about other people, you'd know after hearing this story a good deal about Pharisees. As we listen to that story, we also, if we're perceptive, should learn some things about ourselves and others. Most of all, though, this account teaches us about Jesus and how he sees people and therefore how we should see others and how we should see ourselves. The world judges people far differently than Jesus. In the eyes of the world, there was only one way of looking at the sinful woman and the Pharisee, namely, one of them is the good guy and one is the bad guy. Simon, of course, would be the good guy in most people's eyes. He was a prominent man. He, he was a householder. He was very religious. He was a prominent member of the synagogue. He was the type you would expect to invite a visiting rabbi to his house for dinner. No doubt he gave his 10% tithe offerings every Saturday. And as a Pharisee, of course, he prayed in public every day of the week wearing his prayer shawl. At other times, people would see him passing through town wearing his long robe on his way to a council meeting at the synagogue. And of course, as a Pharisee, he knew much about the intricacies of the Talmud, the rabbinic commentary on Old Testament scripture. He was Simon the Pharisee. Pharisee had actually become his last name. And then there was that other person at his house who was also probably enough well-known, most thought that people knew her too well. In our day and age, they would have referred to her as lowlife, but in this day and age, she was referred to simply as a sinner. She's the kind of person that Simon wouldn't be caught dead in the same room with if he had something to say about it. She most certainly was not invited to the dinner. Yet somehow, she had gotten wind of where Jesus was. She had grabbed an alabaster jar of perfume and she had found a way into that house. Something Jesus had preached in town that day had so moved her that she had found a way to the world, to normal right-thinking people. He was the good guy, but she was to be avoided like the plague. The world has very clear-cut ideas about certain things, and this is one of them. But Jesus has his own way of looking at people. And as far as Jesus was concerned, these two people were far more similar than, than most people would think. Because Jesus saw that both of these two as all people were in a very serious predicament, the very same predicament. These people were both in desperate need of rescue. Jesus saw sin and death in both of them. And in his infinite compassion, 
Jesus wanted to give both of these individuals the very same gift. He wanted to rescue them and give them eternal life. That's why Jesus had come to town. That's why he had preached that day, calling out to the world around him God's compassion. If you are burdened by sin, I have come to lift you up. If you desire eternal life, I have come to give it to you as a gift. <coughs> Simon had an agenda in inviting Jesus to dinner. Oh, not totally creepy as an agenda, but his agenda was, let's invite the new rabbi over and we can have a nice intellectually stimulating conversation and uh, it won't look too bad on my resume either that Jesus came to my house to talk with me. Jesus, of course, had an agenda too. The difference was Jesus' agenda was not self-serving at all. Jesus' agenda was love. He had come to seek and to save the lost. And Simon was one of the lost. And so Jesus gladly accepted the invitation. How could he possibly turn down the chance to share the gospel with not only Simon, but with his other Pharisee friends? When the surprise visitor started wiping Jesus' feet with her hair, Jesus overheard what Simon was thinking in his head, saying to himself. What he said was, if this man were a prophet, he would realize who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, because she is a sinner. Jesus could have scolded him at that point, but he didn't. Jesus sought to win him for the kingdom, and that's when he told him the story about the two debtors and the lender, the one who owed a couple years' worth of salary and the one who owed less than two months' salary. Jesus wanted to teach Simon what the gospel of God really is, namely forgiveness for sinners who are hopelessly in debt to God for their many sins. Both whatever the sins were of this sinful woman and the much more subtle sins of self-righteousness of the Pharisee. Both of those kinds of sins accumulate an unpayable debt to God. And Jesus cared enough to witness to the Pharisee but Jesus also had great concern for the sinful woman. Simon and his other guests were absolutely shocked that an untouchable sinner first sneaks into the house and then begins touching the rabbi, and he, he doesn't even tell her to be discreet, much less to stop. And Jesus' silent acceptance of this woman's presence and actions says so much. He really cares about her. He loves her. He accepts her. It says that Jesus saw in her heart the repentance and faith that had made her so driven to show her love for him. When he spoke in town that day, she had heard his invitation and taken it personally to heart. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest for your souls. Jesus viewed both of these individuals in the exact same way as people who needed his love. But his reaction to the two was quite different. While he was equally concerned about both of them, he assures this poor woman that her faith has saved her and that her sins are forgiven through her faith in him. 
He assures her that she may truly go home in peace, a forgiven member of his eternal kingdom. Simon hears no such words from Jesus. Jesus looked at these people so differently than the world would and does. Jesus saw them both as they truly are, both sinners, both debtors to God, both deeply in need of forgiveness and salvation. One of them realized it, one of them didn't, but they were both in the same boat. They both needed forgiveness. One of them knew it and received it. The other one didn't. He needed to be taught about his sin. Now, how tempting it is for us to make external surface judgments about people before we even know them. Oh, she'd be a good prospect for the church, but he sure wouldn't. Or he's a real good guy, but oh, that, that lady, forget it. Jesus saw the thoughts of both these debtors. We, of course, can't see into people's hearts. Jesus knew why Simon had invited him to dinner and came anyways. He knew that it was a self-serving invitation. Jesus also knew what was in this woman's heart, what had so driven her to show him love. Namely, Jesus saw faith in her heart. But if you had been there that day and had observed these, these two people and the interaction between all of them, you wouldn't have had to read anybody's heart. You would have only needed to look at their deeds. Simon, the respectable, very proper Pharisee, was hardly courteous to Jesus that day. In the days when everyone wore sandals and nobody paved streets, you just automatically welcomed people into your house by either washing their feet if you were really nice, or at the very least offering them a laver of water and a, and a towel, and Simon didn't bother with that. We're told that Simon didn't even offer the Middle Eastern version of a handshake to Jesus, which is that Middle Eastern twofold hug slash kiss thing. Nothing, absolutely nothing. On the other hand, this woman, she washes Jesus' feet with her tears. And she dries them with her hair, which, which a woman would never let down before bedtime. But here she is in somebody else's house and she turns her own hair into the towel. And then she takes this alabaster jar of perfume that no doubt she's used for, for her questionable dates in the evening up until this point. But now she puts it all over Jesus' feet. Amazing. She does exactly what Isaiah meant when he said how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation. You can't hide true love and you can't fake it, at least not in the long run, either. Actions like theirs can only be produced by genuine emotions and motives. Those who can't help producing fruits of love because they know and feel Jesus' love in their hearts, well, you can see that they're believers. And what is a believer? It's somebody who knows their own sin and truly treasures Jesus' forgiveness. Those who don't believe that can't hide the barrenness of their hearts any more than Simon the Pharisee could. Simon's problem was that he hadn't been moved by Jesus. When Jesus preached, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. 
All Simon could think is, eh, I had a pretty good night's sleep last night. When Jesus told the crowd that he had come to seek and to save the lost, Simon thought, well, very few people know the directions the way I know them. When Jesus offered forgiveness, Simon's reaction was, yeah, that's kind of nice, but I wish Jesus wouldn't go around giving it away so cheaply to such sinful people like this lady. When Jesus offered new life through the living word, Simon's thought was, you know, I'm pretty happy with this life I got, and it's a very spiritual and religious life. Just look at my standing at the synagogue. As Jesus unfolded for him the little parable showing his desire to save the greatest of sinners, Simon still remained untouched, neatly propped up, arms folded at his place at the table. Simon had no faith, and therefore Simon showed no love. We're only told those reclining at the table with him began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? Did they eventually come to faith? We're not told. But this woman certainly had. Jesus made it abundantly clear. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven. That is why she loved so much. But the one who is forgiven little loves little. Then Jesus said to her, Your sins have been forgiven. And he told her, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Do you want Jesus to say that to you too? What does Jesus see when he looks at you? Certainly he sees the same thing he saw when he looked at both the sinful woman and Simon the Pharisee. He sees in you somebody deeply, deeply in debt. Someone in need of salvation. Do you see that in yourself too? Because if you do, then Jesus has a special word for you. Your sins have been forgiven. Go in peace. And if you don't, then Simon, I have something to tell you. May God show us our sins so that we may truly see in Jesus our Savior and show him our love. Amen.